this has all led to something. So you, you've got this, this um, affinity with these cars, as we've said. That's led to something tremendously exciting. Brundle Motorsport, which must sound amazing. Tell us all about it. How, why, who, when, w- what caused this to happen? So me with a lot of cars, mostly. Um, but the, <laughs> the, the aim of it is obviously you get some, some great racing. I mean, uh, incredible racing, uh, you know, 20 GT40s up Eau Rouge happens every September. And and there are a, a group of people who know about this racing and, and it is and it's big, you know, people attending at the racetrack, but it's not really broadcast, yeah. you know. Uh, uh, and the more I see about uh, motorsport broadcasting and the more uh, time I spend kind of with the weird helicopter view of racing that, ge- that that being involved in motorsport broadcasting gives you, the more I think, you know, I, I hear people say, I want these cars to move around. I want them to be loud. I want them to be fast. And the more I make the connection that actually a lot of things that the motorsport audience want are happening right now in historic racing. Someone just needs to shine a light on it simultaneously. You know, historic motorsport uh, is it a crossover point, and it's a very interesting crossover point based around the inevitable mortality of human beings. That yeah. there are now a group of people who are in love with these cars, and the reason they're in love with these cars is because race cars of the fifties and you know, people kind of my dad's age. You know, race cars of the fifties and mid sixties. They watch them racing as they grew up and they remember them, right? So they've kept these race cars running because they really wanted to drive them when they were 15. And now they've got the opportunity to drive them by hook or by crook and they have uh, and they race them. But there will come a time where those people are unable to race those cars anymore. And they are not, you know, either armed to do so or old or passed on or whatever. So historic racing needs... Uh, you know, sort of the other side of the other side of the deal, if you like, is that historic racing needs a new generation to be resold these racing cars on the basis that they're fast and loud and awesome as they are. Movies like Le Mans 66 do such a brilliant job of that, but we need to keep on doing it. Otherwise, they'll all get thrown in a shed and just rot themselves to bits, which would be tragic considering the fact that the audience, when they see this stuff, and I've got the numbers to prove it, love this stuff yeah. you know um, so, so how do we sort that out because I, I mean when i was growing up i watched formula one generally obviously because of the teams and formula one's probably a bit of an exception here you you get real hardcore team fans as much as you do the driver but for me it's it's a lot about the driver and i have my favorite drivers I, I have to admit, I'm not au fait with historic racing yet this will probably you know start tuning me into it a little bit but is it about the people who are driving those historic cars and, and getting younger people behind the wheel? Is that one way we're going to try and, you know, ramp it up a little bit? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, yeah, firstly, getting younger people behind the wheel. Secondly, you know, there is an amazing, amazing innovation called the internet. And it's where a new generation do their viewing, they do their televisioning, they do their buying, they do their selling. So, you know, I am kind of in a sweet spot age where uh, I can drive and, uh, and I'm interested in these cars, but also like sort of the first era of racing driver really to sort of discover the power of, of, the, of being able to reach everyone in the world instantly, yeah. you know? And I, I honestly think that if the internet had existed in 1965, motorsport would have probably been the biggest sport in the world in fact if the internet existed in 1965 motorsport would probably be banned by now because because people could see how extreme and how unbelievable and and how vicious those cars are so but i think by by sort of communicating that using the tools that we have today to to sell the cars that we had yesterday you can get a a, a very long way so as uh, Jamie Chadwick is on a sort of one woman crusade to get women's racing more into the limelight and more bums on seats. Is this Alex Brundle on a, on a one man crusade to bring historic racing into the front of everyone's minds? Yeah, I think, I think it's fair to call it a crusade. I think it's, it's, I think it's a valid plight, you know, uh, uh, and also 
kind of looking at things ecologically as much as anything i mean it's not the most ecological pursuit but trying to push forward the 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 forum of things like sustainable fuels as an option moving into the future you know kind of say say things like yes i understand that uh, you know we can move forward in terms of our fueling technologies and our energy technologies but even still the most ecological car available in the marketplace today is the car that already exists that you don't have to build yeah does that mean you have to go and buy a 1961 corvette c1 no it doesn't but it's still something worth communicating uh, and i just I love race cars. This encapsulates everything I love about race cars. And I think that it's worth communicating to a new generation to see if they feel the same. Yeah, absolutely. And Brundle Motorsport as, as an entity supported by Adrian Flux. Yes. It, so, so what's the setup there? So are you now effectively a team boss and driver and will have other drivers racing for you? Correct. So over the years in the World Endurance Championship, I, I've driven for multiple teams where, I mean, it, think, think of it as sort of Tolman Endstone, uh, Benetton Endstone, Alpine Endstone. I'm doing a kind of a, a similar thing. So we organize, we promote, um, but there are a group of people who know how to run and operate these cars. And it would be incredibly silly of me to go, you know what, all of you, I, I can do a better job than you. Um, and so I'm just going to go out on my own, set up a workshop. Alex Brundle and a spanner tries to run an E-type Jag, not very smart. So we're collaborating in the industry to try to use the kind of expertise of those people to, to run these cars. And then I'm doing what I'm good at, which is communicating the racing. We're inviting a, a load of different guests along that go across the eras of motorsport. So some drivers that the uh, the kind of uh, traditionalist racing fans uh, will be across. For example, we've got David Brabham driving for us at, at the Goodwood members meeting. Some drivers that will be entirely uh, familiar to the new generation, YouTubers, you know, Instagram stars uh, and people like that to try to get the broadest possible appeal uh, for the for the championship, um, for the for the team that we can. Uh, and we're going to race four cars o over the year, over some of the biggest racing festivals across you know, the UK and Europe with guest drivers behind the wheel. I'm properly throwing them at the cars and saying, have a go in that. See yeah. how you get on. We're insuring it. Please try not to crash it. But, you know, le let's see. I'm sure some of them are going to be outstandingly, wildly brilliant. I'm sure some of them are going to be struggle a little bit more but that's going to be the joy and the fun of it yeah i'm already shitting myself slightly at the prospect of someone <laughs> crashing one of those very lovely cars talking of which can you pinpoint a favorite what's your favorite classic car to take on track uh so i drove in the middle of last year and anybody who's been following uh our, our progress um will know will be able to say which car i'm going to say immediately but i drove a 512m ferrari which is the Anybody who likes the original Le Mans movie by Steve McQueen, you've obviously got the 917 Porsche. The 512M Ferrari is the other one. Yeah, it's the Ferrari that they're racing against. Um, it's a V12, um, often often mistaken for a flat 12, but it's a V12. And it, you know, you push the throttle down and it sounds like the earth is rotating backwards. The car is not going forward. <laughs> it is just full on, you know, full on, full on bit of machinery. Okay, second part to that question. Where would you take it? Favourite track? Uh, so I've been begging and pleading uh, to, to take it to the Le Mans Classic because I, I just want to hear it. I just want to hear it in fifth gear, pulling pulling down the Montan. Um, but, I mean, I, I have I've raced at the Le Mans Classic and I don't think I've ever been so frightened in my life, frankly. Really? It, it was just... The, the, the thing is that th this kind of racing, people kind of look at it and go it's just you know a load of sort of kind of tweedy blazer brigade hanging out with their cars man yeah. it is the most extreme stuff yeah like i can imagine won't. but this but this is the challenge isn't it that's the perception that that people like you have got to change and, and let's hope it does it